Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to um, our event this morning. Before we start, I'd like to hand the microphone to Auntie Joyce, who's kindly agreed to come and open this, um, uh, uh, this event uh, by giving us a welcome to country. Thank you so much for being here, Auntie Joyce. Thank you very much. My name's Joyce Donovan. I'm a Darawal Wadi Wadi woman. My ear is from La Perouse, right down to the Shellhaven River. Uh, you know, how honoured to come here where, where it's um, to do with women in engineering. Because if you look at traditional times, uh, you know, look at the um, engineering of the boomerang. Who can take a piece of wood and make it return? You know, catch your food, come back. Uh, that's engineering the traditional Aboriginal people done. What about the coolerman, what was used? From a, a, you know, a bit of wood again to carry babies, to use as, um, for ceremonial practices or to hunt and gather for the women mostly. What about all the other things, you know, if people didn't have a go at all the engineering and the science, the science and the engineering of making nets, a big long, weaving, a big long net with a wide opening where people would go to the water and chase the fish in. And they'd go into the larger part and they'd just shake it and it'd go down to the lower part. So that that was like a refrigerator. It was in the water till you needed them. And they couldn't escape. When we take a look at traditional times, and if we could go back in time, if we have a look at, say, birth and places for Aboriginal women, which is a place just for Aboriginal women, where um, there would always be fresh water running, where there'd always be the natural herbs and the medicine. Leaves would have been washed in the creeks and the rivers with the toxins taken out. You know, people think uh, Aboriginal people uh, took stuff for pain too. We're not that tough. <laughs> <laughs> we need a bit of help too. And this was all done like in a lot of traditional areas through poultices being made. <clears throat> and when you have a look at the wheat packs today, Aboriginal women would always have the, um, you know, piece of bark with the warm ashes rolled in it and applied to the abdomen for pain. So it was a place for women. We know now that... Um, mother's attachment is very important. That's why all the women were there. That was a women's place. You'd have heard different dialects, different languages, because there's well over 600 uh, different languages in Aboriginal communities. For us, we're saltwater people, and our traditional foods come from the sea. And I know that um, mullet fish, when we see the wattle, the little fluffy balls of yellow wattle. And I know that as a little girl, my mother would tell me, this is the time that the mullet fish are running. Uh, we, we know all those things because our people looked at all the plants and followed all the seasons to know when it was time to go to the highlands, to maybe hunt for porcupine or gather medicines. We still used mullet fish as our main medicine if our people are sick. Abalone, abalone, we call that our spirit food. And um, so we have different medicines for, to different areas. You know, getting back to women in engineering, and I know that as an Aboriginal woman, I was born at La Perouse and my mother was born there too. Uh, my mother's Aboriginal, my father's Irish, uh, but I grew up with my mother's people at La Perouse. Uh, my great-grandmother was a full-blooded Aboriginal woman who, going back in 1909, was against the law for Aboriginal people to be in the possession of liquor. And I know that my uh, mother's nan, she was caught at Kayama, so the police arrested her, and they could do that. That was the law. Um, Aboriginal people were taken to other places. And I know that my grandmother's 
grandfather was a full-blooded Aboriginal man. And our people had tribal names. My grandmother's uh, grandfather, his name was George Gilbert, and his tribal name was Granbaru. But they, like a lot of other Aboriginal people, were taken to other areas by the missionaries. So that down in Victoria, uh, at a place called Ramanyak, when my great-grandfather's father went there, he, he had a, a yoke put around his neck and um, had to pull the plough. And, you know, we talk about the stolen generations. I'm very lucky I grew up with my mother's people. And part of our storylines and history is the stories that are passed down. So I always knew that my grand, great-grandmother ran away on a bullock's team from a place called Ramanyak in Victoria. Her mother had died aged 30 of exhaustion. And, and so her father had an arranged marriage again to a 16 year old. Um, and it's very important. And, and when you think about it, in 2023, we are still finding very important people from those storylines. Very quickly, I'd like to talk about the obstacles um, with education. Um, I promote education to the fullest because for Aboriginal people, uh, education can mean whether you live or die. It can determine uh, whether you become a black death in custody, whether you become a victim because without education, uh, uh, you know, we've, our people have got no living employment skills. So once you go, and, and remember too, our people in a lot of places, they didn't accept the Aboriginal people because our people were put and trained, uh, same as my, pe my family, as domestic servants. Also, I know that I was taken from an idyllic little place at La Perouse, along with 10 other young girls after me and I was 13 and put into um, Parramatta Girls' Home, which is referred to as um, being equal to uh, one ton and over. Now, as a girl, as, a, as women, we had no skills. We, we were to clean up the servants. We were bred for that. But at a young age, I was gonna be a grandmother um, at 38, and I needed to help my daughter, so we couldn't work for nothing anymore in the communities. And I went to TAFE. I'd just like to say that was like a little tiny door opening. I could read and write, but not that good. That little tiny going to TAFE. Um, not only, is, and my papers when I got out of the, um, the home was coloured and not too bright. And they never, I thought, what colour? What, you know, they haven't got the name of the colour just coloured and not too bright. After that little tape course, I got a job in um, Aboriginal Health in 1983. I went on, to cut a long story short, I went on to, I graduated from Cumberland College of Health Science in 1983. Done so many little courses because I was hungry for education. About 10 years ago, I went and done a Double B8 UTS University in Adult Education and Community Management. But in 1995, working in Aboriginal Health, there was myself and another Aboriginal woman who went and done nursing. And you know, I'm a very proud Darawell Waddy Waddy woman, but I'm also a very, very proud um, nurse because I believe our people were the healers. My mother was a healer with the medicines, our people with the doctors and the lawyers, and most important, the healers. So very, very um, um, happy that we could um, go into these uh, different education realms. You know, coming back to women, it's so exciting to think that we've got, you know, engineering is really a male dominated, well, you think of it as being male dominated. You know what, our best leaders are the women. We're called the backbones of our community. So please remember that. And you know, when we do something like this, you're inspiring other women. Not taking anything away from the males, but I think this is about the women. Um, 
We are the backbone, and I always say, women had all, Aboriginal women in traditional days, done all the hard work. The men sat down and made laws. <laughs> so we've all <laughs> done the same um, You know, um, that's just how it was. Women, you know, we, we've, we've, we've always been strong, but maybe we weren't allowed to show that strength. Um, and you know, when I found my people, uh, well, well these, this mob down at Ramignac, because my great-grandfather's father, he, he, he married again. He married and, uh, and um, you know, the first thing I said when they rang, because all my life from a little girl, my mother would tell the story about her granny coming on the Bullock's team and getting away. And she always told me, women had our own culture. We had our own culture. We had our own ceremonies. So, you know, now and again you'll hear males saying, oh, women can't do this, women can, and we do. And, and you know, when I met one of those people related to my great-grandmother who were the Gilberts, I spoke to this woman and she said, Auntie Joycey, you know, do you mind if I ring? I said, I've waited, I said, I'm 78. I've heard these bits of stories uh, for so long. And the first question I said to Marjorie, her name is, I said, have you got bossy, bossy women? And all she done was laugh. She never told me, I found out later, it's Lydia Thorpe's mother. So um, I guess we have got bossy women. Uh, uh, and it was strange because, you know, I'm so proud of women uh, to achieve. We can reach for the stars. We are strong. We multitask, that's been proven. So all I could say, <clears throat> you know, keep going because when someone sees a woman succeed, you inspire another 10, 20 women. So, and, and in our communities, if someone, you know, no one ever went to TAFE in my time. I'm one of six. The only one left were the sickest, were the poorest people in the world. But we're also the oldest culture. And you, uh, and it's, and you then become an inspiration and a role model back in your community. And for the women in engineering, it's not only your community. You inspire all the women. You know, we can do engineering. We can reach for the stars. So, Wadiya, Mare, Yagana. I wish everybody here today nothing but success and the doors open. And please, don't give up and go higher, reach higher. So on behalf of the Darawal Wadi Wadi people, I might just say before I go, I'm a stickler for time. I'm an old nurse and I've never worked on curry time. <laughs> I spend a lot of time being the first at meetings. I check everything out, make sure the water's there. So they changed the time here, and I thank God I didn't know till I walked in the door, because I'm early, I was 10.30. So please forgive me, because that's something that nurses, you know, we can't afford to be late, and I hate to keep people waiting. So please accept my apologies for being late. Um, and on behalf of the Darawal Wadi Wadi people, welcome, 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 and keep going, and hey, I'm, I'm, uh, we tend to drop our H's, by the way. We tend to say, it could be very embarrassing as a nurse talking about oxygen <laughs> instead of oxygen. But please aim high, aim for the, the stars, because those, you're inspiring so many other females. So welcome on behalf of the Darawal Wadi Wadi people. And thank you very much. Well, thank you so thank much, you. Auntie Joyce. Um, I think we can probably call an end to this day now because Auntie Joyce has really <laughs> summed it up so beautifully. <laughs> it's a great reminder that as women, we are strong. We can do, we do. Um, and I also like the fact that you place that emphasis on education because that's that's really what it's all about um, I'd also like from my side just to acknowledge that we are meeting on Darawal country today and I want to acknowledge elders past present and emerging and any indigenous people here today um, we recognize your connection to country and um, we have so much to learn from you so um, we, we hope to get some some of your strength and wisdom today 
Um, and again, this is International Day for Women in Engineering. Um, so welcome to this event where we're going to celebrate. <laughs> so welcome to this event where we're going to celebrate all the wonderful women in engineering who identify as female. So um, uh, welcome to all our, our, our special um, guests and uh, people from the university. So a special word of welcome to Senator Marine Faruqi, who is our, our keynote speaker for today. And she is an engineer, so she's one of us. Um, um, welcome to the Vice Chancellor of the University of Wollongong, um, Professor uh, Patricia uh, Davids, and also to the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Engineering and Information Sciences, uh, Senior Professor Gersel Alici. I'm uh, Madeleine de Troyes. I'm um, a Professor in Materials Engineering and also the Executive or the um, Associate Dean for uh, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion. Um, welcome also to all the staff and students from the university. Um, welcome to members from the Illawarra community who are here today. And a special welcome to the future engineers who may be here today and also joining us in the live stream. Um, you're basically what all of, all of this is about because what we want to do today is to tell you a little bit about what engineers do, and especially women engineers, and also to tell you a bit about the difference that people, uh, that engineers are making in the world. As you know, we're facing some of the biggest problems that mankind's ever faced, and engineers will be at the forefront of solving those problems. So we have wonderful engineers working in the fields of um, renewable energy, um, sustainable development, um, in the health sciences, um, looking at our aging population, um, supporting our, our, our health industry, we're looking at biodegradable plastics, to reduce pollution. So those are all areas where engineers can and will make a difference. The sad story is that we're facing a massive shortage of engineers in industry at the moment. And Engineers Australia estimate that we, we're looking at a shortage, a future shortage of engineers of about 50,000 to 100,000 engineers. And at this stage, our domestic graduates can only make up about a third of that shortfall. So um, the country will be desperate for engineers. And for those of you who are still thinking about a possible career, that's a good news story because it means you'll have an abundance of opportunities if you choose engineering. But it's also bad news for those of us who work in the industry. Um, and I think that's a fantastic opportunity for young girls and young women who are thinking about entering engineering. Um, we need your voices. Um, we need your perspectives. Um, we need you to help us solve all, all of these um, issues facing us today. Now before I hand over to, um, to the Vice Chancellor of the University, just a few housekeeping things. Um, please make sure that your cell phones are switched off or in silent mode. Um, the toilets are just outside the door and to the right. And if anything does happen, I hope it doesn't, um, if there is an emergency, please listen to the staff members um, who will um, give you some advice on what to do. The emergency evacuation point is just outside the building on the McKinnon lawn. And um, before I forget, um, there will be, you'll have the opportunity to ask some questions later on. So um, if you have any burning questions for our keynote speaker or our panelists, um, please, um, just make a mental note, you will get the opportunity uh, to ask those questions later on. And um, we will also introduce the panelists a little bit later. So without further ado, I'd like to invite the Vice Chancellor of the University of, um, of Wollongong, um, Professor uh, Patricia, uh, Patricia Davidson, um, to come forward and give some opening remarks. Thanks so much, Madeline, and uh, welcome everyone, uh, wonderful women and men who get it. It's great to see so many people here today. Um, it's also uh, our pleasure to have our uh, distinguished guest, the Senator Faruqi. Well, we'll hear more today. But as um, Madeline said, today we've come to celebrate um, International Women in Engineering Day and to really celebrate women and engineers that are working to transform our world. Um, I think it's evolving that the critical issues facing our world uh, from climate uh, to the care of the elderly require engineering uh, solutions. 
Um, thank you, Madeline, for all of your work. I know you've really put so much effort into it. And Aunty Joyce's um, did a fabulous welcome to country. And, you know, I'm another old bossy nurse, so watch out there. <laughs> um, and whenever I'm uh, here on this beautiful uh, campus, sitting between the Pacific Ocean and the Illawarra Escarpment, you know, I'm in awe of the lands and also the history of the Aboriginal people. And we as the University of Wollongong accept the gracious invitation of Aboriginal people to have a voice for their sovereignty in Parliament. Um, we're also in particular very honoured to have Senator Marine Furuki here who will give a keynote address and share her insights on women in engineering. Um, and Senator is a civil and environmental engineer, also a passionate academic, and it has been a lifelong activist for social and environmental justice. Uh, you are truly an inspiration for women everywhere, um, and in particular for women in engineering who seek uh, to break through glass ceilings, but achieve their dreams, but more importantly, have a voice for others. And I know um, it's not commonly said, but the life of a politician is really one of service, and uh, thank you for that. I think uh, diversity is a fundamental pillar of progress and innovation in any profession. Um, but it's, I think, particularly important in fields that have been traditionally very gender-based. Um, the stereotype of women, of men, of engineering rather, is, is a man. But, you know, even I'm constantly surprised. Uh, Gersel and I were at the Steelworks the other day and you know I'm just sur surrounded by amazing women our graduates who are just without taking any sort of standing back just engaging in that work and so um, I think the University of Wollongong is really keen uh, to develop that generation that are going to develop innovative and smart solutions to complex problems. <coughs> when Aunty Joyce was uh, talking about her role as, as a, a nurse, where in my previous role of, at, um, I worked very closely with the Faculty of Engineering um, and in fact we had a joint PhD program in nursing and engineering and we would often, the engineers would say to me, um, you know, nurses have no end of problems in, in their workplace to, to solve and engineers are all about solving problems. So I think it's a, a great partnership, you know, in particular healthcare more broadly and engineering because there are some things um, that have been bugaboos since I was a young nurse, which was a long time ago and uh, still are today. And I think it's because they've never been looked at through the lens of engineering. But really more to the purpose of today, I think when women are empowered to make decisions and create change, society benefits. The health and well-being of our modern world is really dependent upon the health and well-being of women. And I think this is not a, 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 you know, ideological affirmation. It is something, if you look at any OECD data, where women are healthier and better educated, their children are better, healthier and educated. There is more social participation and economic productivity. I think today um, is... is a story of paying it forward and I think Aunty Joyce has really started that in terms of how she is paying it forward. We're going to hear from the Senator in how she is paying it forward. But also, you know, I feel a strong sense of responsibility in my role in making sure uh, that we strive for diversity more pro broadly and equity diversity and inclusion is really an important part. Um, I'd like to sort of commend the faculty, um, Executive Dean Gursul Alishi, Madeline, who have identified, and all the faculty and students that have really doubled down on this really important issue. I, when um, in the interview process for <laughs> Gursul, the Executive Dean, I reflected on, in my previous role at Johns Hopkins, the president of the university said to me, you have to get 50% of men in nursing, and <coughs> to, <the coughs> to the dean of engineering, you have to get 50% of women. 
And I think that just speaks to um, not the, the binary approach, which we know in diversity is, is not always a positive lens, but just having those, that being very thoughtful and intentional about striving for that can, will bring all sorts of diversity. And I'm really very grateful to Gersel for that and Madeline, but more importantly to the faculty and the staff and the students of the f engineering, because we know unless you create an inclusive environment, unless our professors are welcoming these women into their labs, no matter what I think or prescribe is not going to happen. So I'd like to think um, today is a celebration as well for the, for the faculty. Um, it's also something that we're really strategically committed to. Um, it's great to see the, this activity today, the activity of the REN group, and we really want to keep pushing this agenda forward. I think um, I'm so looking forward to hearing from the Senator. I've seen what she does, her work. Um, and I, again, for in particular, uh, for the potential engineering students live streaming today, uh, please um, consider you know, engineering as an important choice. Challenge stereotypes. And, and really follow your heart and dreams. And when you get there, send down the ladder for more women to come up. Thank you. Now, follow the instructions. <laughs> Which is something that I'm not um, all that well prepared for often. <laughs> um, so it's now my great pleasure to welcome to the podium our distinguished guest for today, uh, Senator Farouk. It's We're just so honoured that you're here. We have all been watching Senate over the last few weeks and it's been a very, very tumultuous time. So uh, please come forward or have I made a mistake? I'm, I'm good. <laughs> One thing is admitting you make a mistake. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> for the Greens for about 10 different portfolios 
um, that included transport, roads and ports, animal welfare, status of women, young people, multiculturalism, and more and more. And now in the Australian Senate, I hold responsibility for six portfolios, which uh, include education, animal welfare, the republic, anti-racism, and um, a few others. And I also have the responsibility of being the deputy leader for the Australian Greens. And I believe that there are two main reasons why I am able to fulfill my responsibilities, you know, you know work on these huge variety of portfolios. And those two reasons are quite relevant to why we are here today. Uh, number one, I am an engineer. And you know, we have been trained to think you know, quite analytically in a structured kind of critical manner. And then two, and I think Auntie Joyce alluded to that, I am a woman and we can do many things at the same time, we do know that. But truth be told, engineering is one of the loves of my lives. Um, I do come from a family of engineering tragics. My dad was an engineer, my three siblings are, are engineers, all civil engineers. My husband is a civil engineer, my father-in-law was a civil engineer. <laughs> I, of course, am a civil engineer. My daughter is a civil engineer. <laughs> she actually just graduated last week um, with a PhD in civil and environmental engineering. So I'm a very proud mom. Um, <laughs> so you know where my love from engineering comes from. Um, and you know, I'll give you one example of how much I love this profession. I've been over the Sydney Harbour Bridge hundreds, if not thousands of times, you know, on the train, on the bus, in a car. I've walked across it. But I tell you, every time I do this, even now, it gives me goosebumps. And the reason for that is that I just marvel at that, you know, that steel arch structure. It, it really is a, an incredible masterpiece of engineering, not just in the way that it is built, but also it reminds me of the vision um, that engineers have for the future. It was built like, what, 75 years ago, uh, or about that. But it even serves the purpose now. So from what I have heard, when the bridge was uh, first opened, all the cars in Sydney could fit on that bridge. <laughs> um, so it was like massively kind of, I, I guess, um, much more capacity than was needed at that time. Um, and, and that's, for me, is like a really important reminder of what engineers can do and what vision they have. And my dad used to say, that engineers can do anything and everything. I grew up hearing that. And I know, yes, he was a bit biased being an engineer, but you know, you can't deny that we do think creatively and we really, we are hard workers. Engineering is not an easy degree um, to go through. And we are trained problem solvers. Uh, we are also more likely to calculate risks and to deliver frank and fearless advice on big and complex questions. And it is this creativity and fearlessness, I think, that is much needed if we want to resolve the challenges that we face today. And you've heard about some of those challenges already. I mean, globally also, women are on the front lines of so many of these challenges, from the climate emergency, um, to war and com conflict, to economic inequality. And in Australia, similar issue, like, you know, women earn less, we have more student debt, a housing and rental crisis impacts us disproportionately, and of course, violence against women still persists. And these are just some of the examples of disadvantages that we face as women. Yet, when it comes to a seat at the table to actually make decisions about resolving on these difficult problems, we miss out. We really do miss out again. Um, and it gets worse. It gets worse when you look through that intersectional lens um, you know, of women, because we're not a conglomerate of women, you know, there are women within our group which face more disadvantage than others, so women of color, First Nations women, trans women, refugee women, for example. You know, when I took up my role, or even now actually, since taking up my role in politics, there's one question that I have been repeatedly asked, and that is about my journey from an engineer and a migrant uh, from Pakistan to the Australian Senate and how someone like me ended up where I have ended up. It is a fair question because there are very few like me still um, in politics and political decision making. And my friends often half jokingly point out 
how many minority boxes I tick, migrant, Muslim, woman of color, and an engineer. And usually I kind of laugh it off, uh, but there is, if you think about it a bit, there is quite a serious edge to this observation that underlies the lack of gender, professional, cultural, and ethnic diversity in our parliaments, but generally in places where decisions are often made. Um, our parliaments, for example, are not at all reflective of the diversity that lives in our streets and suburbs. And yes, things have improved a little bit after um, the last election last year, but we are still very far away from true representation. Um, and I was very surprised when I started my role in New South Wales Parliament. I was really surprised because the media dug, dug this up. I didn't even think about it. It reported the fact that I was the first Muslim woman ever to sit in any parliament in Australia. And then um, I became the first Muslim woman to sit in the Australian Senate for the first time in 2018. And on top of that, I found out that I was only the 100th woman. This is 2018, people, let's not forget. I was only the 100th woman to enter the Senate in 2018. So that is the state of affairs in the 21st century in our country. And it really shows how at odds the makeup of political representation in this country is with the people who actually live here. And you know, as I said, it's replicated in so many other areas, engineer, especially when it comes to leadership positions in the media, in engineering. Um, you may have seen a, few, a month ago um, the kerfuffle uh, about ABC and you know, Stan Grant mo moving away from Q&A, and that brought up this issue of how not diverse the executive and the management team and the board of ABC is. And, and it does impact then on how people who work there, who don't kind of fit in with that norm, are treated. So there is this issue of lack of um, you know, representation, which is about equity. But there is also an issue about good decision making as well. Because if we don't have that diversity, then you know, often decisions are shackled by the conformity of opinions. Creative and innovative solutions come when different points of view are represented and debated and a variety of experiences are listened to and heard. That's good for decision making, that's good for democracy, and that is good for equity. Otherwise, we do end up with opinions that are bereft of the depth of complexity, because they are developed within very narrow mandates of political parties and the narrow views that are held within those political parties. Um, I just want to come back for a couple of minutes to my journey from Pakistan to the Australian Senate. Um, as you might know, Pakistan is a country that ranks quite low on the global gender gap scale. Uh, so from an early age, I was pretty acutely aware of um, this inequity and discrimination that exists in law, it exists in society. Obviously, you know, every society, I guess, in, on this globe is patriarchal. Um, and it does prevent, in Pakistan, women from accessing education, work opportunities, or fully participating in decision making. Um, but within this context, I feel that I was very lucky to grow up under the guidance of an aunt who was feminist as fuck, and a father who believed in the power of education um, to change lives. And Auntie Joyce talks about that, and in Pakistan as well. It, like education is kind of the only way to break out of intergenerational inequity and poverty. That is really the only way. So, so you know, for my father, it was really important that his kids get a university education. Um, not necessarily for, you know, getting well-paid jobs, which of course it opens doors for, but for us to be able to, to you know, kind of think in a more creative way, to be able to um, critique decisions that were me being made around us and to be able to participate on those decisions. Um, so when I came to Australia, uh, sorry, in Pakistan, I was kind of very, um, one of the very few women engineers and very few uh, women civil engineers. I had kind of got used to being one of the very few or rather a handful of professional engineers there. Um, and I was accustomed to widespread gender inequities as well. I did have much higher expectations of Australian society, though. 
Um, so you can imagine my surprise when I arrived in Sydney, we migrating here with my husband, my uh, one-year-old son in the early 1990s to find that there was only one female academic in, I think it was about 50, the faculty at that time of the University of New South Wales was, was about 50 academics. Um, so yeah, I was really shocked and I'll tell you why I was shocked. And I reflected upon this quite a bit. I guess why my expectations of Australia were for, so different to Pakistan was the manifestation of the dominant kind of worldview that I had grown up with in a country that was once a British colony. And that worldview was that it was the colonized who always had problems and the colonizers who came there to fix those problems. Living in Pakistan, I imagined that the so-called developed countries would already have achieved equality in every sphere of life, uh, in law, in society. Um, and like I said, indeed, one of the reasons why we migrated here was to live in a society that we thought was supposedly free from bias and discrimination. So that's obviously a view of the world that was marred by crude generalizations and a Western supremacist narrative that had filtered down to me when I was growing up. And I've long since realized that the story and the pervasive kind of sticking power of gender inequity is pretty universal. Uh, but, you know, on the very bright side, our courage to fight back is also very universal. And that's really what gives me hope. Um, and there is no doubt that through the many waves of feminism over the last century, we have fought hard and we have won so many battles. You know, the right to vote and to run for parliaments, to join the workforce, to be engineers, to pursue careers in all professions. Those are some of the rights that we have won. Those rights, though, have not yet really resulted in equity in reality. Because according to the World Economic Forum, it's 2022, that was last year's Global Gender Gap Report, at the current rate of progress, it will take another 135 years to reach full parity. I mean, let that sink in, 135 more years. That's about six generations, or five, more than five generations. And to me, that's completely unacceptable. So we do need to accelerate that pace of change, but we can only do that by working together, by showing solidarity, by teaming up. And it is really critical that us engineers become part of actively disturbing the current status quo. Because we, we have to be, we really have to seriously be an active part of that. You might be surprised to hear that I never never ever wanted to be a politician. <laughs> like I was telling Professor Davidson earlier on, my first love has always been teaching. Uh, and when I started teaching at the University of New South Wales, I thought this was it, you know, I've made it. Um, you know, I've reached my goal in my life. Uh, but politics though was never, never very far from my mind. Uh, in Pakistan, growing up, it's like everyone talks about politics, whether it's the person selling the samosas on the street or, you know, the woman who um, you go to in a beauty parlor to have your hair cut. Everyone talks about politics. And I was quite surprised as well. The other thing that surprised me about Australia were people weren't, at least 30 years ago, weren't that keen about discussing politics. Um, so while I'd never had the desire to be a politician, um, I really had a zest quite early on in life for defying cultural norms and dominant societal views. And my mom often reminds me how at a very early age I used to have massive debates and probably she calls fights with her about um, being allowed to do the same things that my two older brothers were allowed to do. And the two things that I really fought hard for was playing cricket on the streets with the neighborhood boys because that, that was who played cricket on the streets and to fly kites from the roof of my head. Um, and those were hard, hard won battles, I can tell you. When it came time to do civil study civil engineering, it was all fine. I think they were probably tired of, uh, you know, kind of my fights by then. Uh, so for better or for worse, I have always rejected limits that society places on you of what you should and shouldn't do, what you should and shouldn't be. And now, as a senator in, in the Australian Parliament, those kind of childhood tussles are kind of a memory, but 
my passion, I guess, has to see unfairness removed and injustice removed, haven't changed. And I think that I did a lot of practice on that with my mom and dad, so that helps. Um, I am, though, a political outsider in many ways than one. I grew up, firstly, a world away in Lahore. I didn't come through the political ranks of student unions, of party apparatchiks, or political staffers. And I certainly didn't have the networks, the boys' club connections, um, that really seemed so prerequisite for a, you know, for a political career, or what people call as a political career. For me, politics has never been a career. I've never thought of it as a career. It is truly and totally public service. This may be an old-fashioned view, but I, I do think some ideas from the past are worth hanging on to. Engineering. Engineering has been my career. Um, you know, I've had a good 20 years as a structural engineer, as a water engineer, as an environmental engineer, in consulting firms here and in Pakistan, in local government in Sydney and in regional New South Wales, in Port Macquarie, and then as a researcher and academic in environmental sustainability. And I have had, I've really had some amazing opportunities as an engineer. Um, to work on hydropower projects, like massive hydropower projects, but even smaller ones like building coastal cycleways. I've worked on, um, you know, stormwater recycling, wastewater recycling, waste management, on stream rehabilitation, in working with communities on, um, you know, on environmental education. That's that's just a small part of, of the incredible projects that I have worked on in my um, engineering career. And you, you know, I found especially working with local communities on solutions to the problems that we are facing, for example, in floodplain management or estuary management or stormwater management was some of the most fulfilling work that I have done as an engineer. And I've loved every, I've loved every minute of it. And I think the skills that engineers I truly now think back to what my dad used to say, that engineers can do anything and everything. Those skills do, those skills do actually allow you to do so many other things beyond even engineering. And I use those skills in my role um, now as, as a politician. Um, in fact, you know, political decision making desperately needs a new perspective on all the problems, including an analytical and evidence-based approach which I think is still sad, direly missing from politics. I've often seen evidence just completely put to one side um, because there is a political ideology that needs to be pushed. And one reason for that is that there are not enough people like us in that decision-making sphere. So when I joined politics, I took all my lived experience, my engineering expertise, my professionalism, and a very open mind when I stepped into parliament. But most of all, I took with me a spirit of challenging power and questioning the status quo. And I think questioning is also part of engineering training. You've got to question things before you make a decision. And challenging power necessarily involves putting your reputation, your own standing, and sometimes your neck on the line. Um, and I think it is this challenging power bit which has made politics a bit difficult for me um, because no one likes to rock the boat. No one, people who've been in positions of power for a very long time want to stay there um, and you know, not let anyone else enter that space. Um, and at times I have, to, I have had to draw on every last bit of strength that was instilled in me um, by my elders um, to, to basically keep going because um, you know, if you are different or you look different, life isn't easy. Through all the unseen pitfalls though, the pleasant and the unpleasant surprises of politics, the good, the bad and ugly of the place where I work in, I have always been determined to be myself. Um, so you know, I am, I, probably you can tell, I am idealistic. I don't want to lose that idealism. I think you become a real skeptic, a skeptic if you lose that, and you don't see the best in the people that you work with. I do believe if we fight hard, the world can be a better place. I still think I'm not a politician. I still think of myself as an engineer. 
Um, I, I do follow my convictions. I try not to compromise on my values. And I'm definitely not a wheeler or a dealer. I would still try and convince people on evidence. You know, engineers is one of the top professions for ethics and honesty. People do trust engineers. And if we've seen anything in politics in the last few years, it's that corruption has become baked in. So we need more people with integrity and ethics influencing politics. And engineers are definitely a good fit. And when I say politics, I don't mean that engineers should leave their profession and go on and become politicians if you don't want to. I'm talking about influencing. Engineers having a role in influencing politics and political decision making. And I think women engineers are even an even better fit to do that. And I say that because as women, we are quite well aware of the disadvantages that are also baked into the system that we live in. There are structural disadvantages. Um, and as engineers, we, we know all about systems change because that is what is actually needed if we want to accelerate that change towards, par uh, towards parity. We have to dismantle the dominant patriarchal systems that we live in at this point in time. But I do also have to admit that although as engineers we're very good at coming up with solutions to, to the problems we face, we're not really using our skills, capacity, and expertise to the full extent in terms of influencing decisions. We often shy away from politics. I know we are very like practical and you know we just want to do our projects and things, but um, and, and I've heard that too many times from my engineering colleagues that no, no, we want to remain apolitical. There's nothing, there's, there's no one who is apolitical. Can I tell you that first? <laughs> we might want to think that we are, but we really are not. And I was reminded of this detachment from politics at a public forum I hosted a few years ago when a young engineer came up to me and said, oh, we're not really interested in politics. We just want to know what projects government has in the pipeline so we can work on them. I mean, I have to say that I respectfully and completely disagree with this proposition. Because once a project has been determined, it's already too late and too difficult to change the course of where we're heading. The agenda has already been set. All we are left with is making small changes here or there, tinkering you know, around the edges to improve just individual elements of the project. And I'm not saying that's not important, that definitely is important. But it is more important to be involved a bit earlier um, so that you can be involved in the bigger picture and the strategy that leads to that work on the ground. Because now more than ever, we need engineers involved in these decisions, not just delivering an agenda set by politicians. And you are, you are in a prime position to be able to reimagine and reshape, reshape the world in a socially and environmentally responsible way within the limits that nature has placed on us. So there is no reason at all that we can't do all of this. But a few things have to change. And I think as engineers, we have to be involved in demanding that change. And I acknowledge that making change is not easy. But now is the time to really push hard and to take some risks. Now is the time to take the risk of being bold and courageous. I think there isn't much to lose, but everything to gain by doing that. So while I may not have de dreamed of becoming a senator, I've never shied away from pushing these boundaries. Whether it was arguing with my mom in Lahore about playing cricket or flying kites, or studying civil engineering, or now unapologetically pushing for strong action on climate, a fee-free university for building an anti-racist and a feminist Australia. So as engineers, we should be prepared to take more responsibility for creating transformation that we so desperately need. And like I said earlier, you don't have to be party political at all, but please be political. Everyone's story is very different, but our common bond as women in engineering 
means that we share, we do share a natural tenacity, an intellectual capacity, a strength, expertise, and creativity that allows us endless opportunities, which are bound only by the limits of our own imagination. So let's not waste this. Let's get political. Let's speak up. Let's organize. Let's push boundaries. Let's be part of building a movement that restructures power and privilege to unwind centuries of entrenched injustice. And let's do this with hope that things can change, because they can. Thank you so much. Well, that was awesome, wasn't it? Um, so first of all, thank you, Professor Davidson, um, for your opening remarks. I must say it's lovely having a bossy nurse who's passionate about equity, diversity, and, and inclusion in charge of the university. It's made a huge difference to the way we do things. And Senator Faruqi, thank you for sharing your journey with us and also reminding us that it's important that we get out there and that we influence and advocate and manage and lead and bring about um, the changes that's needed in this country. Thank you very much for that. Um, we're now going to move into our panel discussion. And um, I just want to touch on one point. Um, Professor Davidson said we, we're aiming for 50% participation in our faculty of, of, um, of women. And we're not quite there yet. We're still a fair, fair bit off. Um, but interestingly enough, Engineers Australia recently um, published a, a set of research that they that they done to look at why women or the participation of women is in engineering is so low. And they, they came up with a, a list of reasons, and most of those reasons seem to be because we're not doing a very good job at selling the profession to the young girls in school. Um, and those are all things that we can solve. Um, so there's no, no real reason why women don't make good engineers. Now, one of the, the reasons that they highlighted was that there's a lack of female role models in engineering. So that's part of what we're doing today, is we want to present you with some awesome woman who's doing wonderful things in industry um, and in academia, and who are really making a difference out there. So I'm going to hand the microphone to my wonderful colleague, Monsi Ross, who's the Associate Dean for Education in the faculty, who will introduce our panel and also lead the, the, the panel discussion. Thanks, Monsi. Thank you. Thank you, Madeline, and uh, thank you to our distinguished uh, speakers. It's been fantastic to listen to uh, the speeches today and very inspiring for all of us. Um, I'd like to actually uh, introduce our panellists and in order to do that I'd like to invite the Senator and our panellists to come up uh, onto the stage uh, and take a seat so that we'll go through each of the panellists. Um, if you'd like to come up to your seat, um, so I think you're on the far left there, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And what we've done here is we've assembled an incredible combination of amazing female engineers for us to ask questions of, interrogate, and find out how you got there. And for those listening along on the live feed or for any budding young uh, female engineer wannabe, this is where you can find out exactly how these amazing women got to where they are. And uh, we've already seen and heard one amazing and inspiring uh, journey to, uh, uh, to engineering and to, uh, through to politics. Uh, but we've got so many more stories to tell. So I'll start off very quickly because we have already heard um, Senator Faruqi's story. But just quickly, um, Senator Maureen Faruqi is the Deputy Leader of the Australian Greens and Senator for New South Wales. She is a civil and environmental engineer and lifelong activist for social and environmental justice. In 2013, she joined New South Wales State Parliament, becoming the first Muslim woman to sit in an, in an Australian Parliament. Uh, in 2018, uh, Dr. Faruqi became Australia's first Muslim Senator. She has been a passionate advocate against racism and misogyny and holds the portfolios of education, anti-racism, animal welfare, the Republic, and international aid and global justice. So thank you for joining us. 
The first question that I will get each of our panellists to answer, just in a very short, sweet and sharp way, is what motivated you to pursue a career in engineering? <laughs> okay, I'll make it very short because you've heard my story. For me, when I went into engineering, it was really all about equality. It was about going into a male-dominated profession where women have been told, no, this one's not for you. This is a man's job. So I basically wanted to prove that women should be able to do and can do, and sometimes even can do it better <laughs> than others can. <laughs> and then I fell in love with the profession. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So next we have Dr. Rochelle McDonald. Uh, Rochelle has over two decades of experience in the ports and marine industries across regional Australia and has held roles in operations, engineering, development, strategy and project delivery. She is committed to the optimization, efficiency and reliability of squadrons operating assets to enable a successful transition to a green energy future. Rochelle, what motivated you to pursue a career in engineering? Um, I was always really interested in climate change and really understanding the history of climate change and, you know, a, you know particularly in our geological record. So, my grandfather was a mining engineer and he worked throughout the world in really um, remote and regional areas of, of, of China, Bangladesh, um, Australia, so a lot up in the Pilbara and the Northern Territory. And he would bring back slides and photographs and show me of um, amazing uh, uh, developments that were occurring where people were actually uh, carrying everything in, uh, like drill rigs and things, into the middle of the jungle. And there was one particular photo that was of a landslide uh, before and after. Um, and that, for me, was something that I really wanted to study the sciences. So. Um, Originally, I was thinking I was going to do medicine, but I can't stand the sight of blood, so that was out. Um, but then I was going to go into mining. Uh, but I had a real issue with uh, the impact on, um, on the earth and also the impact on climate change. And back when I studied, it wasn't uh, the in thing to do environmental science or anything like that. So I did a degree in earth sciences, which was environmental engineering geology, and subsequently did a PhD in, through public health on um, looking at the exposure of acid, so acid sulfate soils and uh, the impact on the environment of people. And then my engineering degree, uh, well, my further engineering degree, my master's in engineering management. Uh, specialising in major projects. So, so my, uh, really the reason why I did it was following my grandfather's footsteps, but he was somebody that um, believed that there was a place for women and that was looking after children and, um, and you know, providing a home. Whereas me, that absolutely was challenging everything that was normal inside him. He became my biggest advocate for my career. So if I can say something, um, when a little person of 11 years old, when I was deciding what I wanted to do with my life, comes to you and says, can you support me in this? Or can I, can I learn more? Embrace it, because that's what's gonna really create the pathway for people moving into engineering in the future. Great, thank you. And it really just demonstrates the importance of mentorship. And uh, I think the earlier remark was the, the men who get it. Exactly, so thank you very much. So um, our next um, panellist is Michaela Brown. Michaela is a senior structural engineer for Arup. She graduated from UOW in 2004 with first class honours, where she was both a member of the Women in Engineering Society and president of the Civil Engineering Society. She is passionate about design and collaborating with the team to build iconic buildings, uh, bring iconic buildings to life, rather, um, that add real value to the community and help shape our city. Michaela, what motivated you to uh, pursue a career in engineering? Well, I think um, Wollongong has a lot to answer for <laughs> in the university. <laughs> so um, I didn't have any um, uh, engineering mentors uh, growing up, but um, definitely, well, my family was very much, we are good at maths, so um, <laughs> definitely had to, to tick that box. Um, so loved my sciences, my maths, couldn't write an essay to save my life, so definitely need to do something in the uh, sciences or something practical. Um, 
And uh, I actually came to University of Wollongong in year 10, women's in engineering camp. And then it was always, and then like, you know, through 11 and 12, it's like, oh, do I do dentistry or engineering? Do I do, you know, medicine or engineering? Do I do, you know, so I kept coming around like, well, why don't I just do engineering? <laughs> and so, um, and uh, yeah, so came here and just absolutely loved it from like the first subject and every subject I did. Um, and I think the added um, thing that drew me to engineering was made, seeing the tangibility of it, of you know, really seeing, physically seeing um, the difference that you can make and, and contribute to. Great, thank you very much, uh, Michaela. That's often a, a thing that we hear a lot from uh, young people who are choosing mm -hmm. uh, or setting out on their engineering career, making a difference, seeing, seeing your difference uh, whether it be a building or a bridge or whatever, so that's great. Our next panellist is Dr Lauren North. Lauren has a PhD in chemical uh, engineering and is studying an MBA with UOW. She worked for Blue Scope for many years but is now employed by BHP in Principal Sustainability Partnerships where she is supporting the execution of BHP's Climate Strategy and Scope 3 Action Plan. She is also very interested in working with us and supporting diversity in engineering. So, Lauren, what motivated you to pursue a career in engineering? I think I always enjoyed um, science and maths, particularly chemistry and physics, and not so much that biology side of things. Um, and in year 10, I remember we had a careers expo at our school, and Blue Scope actually had one of the stands there. Um, and growing up in Wollongong, obviously going past the steelworks all the time and seeing that big you know, mystery place there where lots of interesting stuff happened. Um, gave me that opportunity to then go and do some work experience there in year 11 and really see what engineering was about um, and get a sense of the scale of how big things are and how complicated some of the problems are within engineering um, and see some of the really cool things the processes can do. So um, that was really part of the striking my journey, I guess, and um, drive me down that track and, yeah, getting me into engineering. Fantastic, really drives home the importance of our work integrated learning programs and getting that experience in the, uh, in, in the workplace and seeing how important engineering is. Uh, our final panellist is Siobhan O'Brien. Uh, Siobhan graduated UAW with a Bachelor of Science and a Bachelor of Engineering in 2017. She was also awarded the University Medal. Siobhan is part of a team of students and researchers led by Professor Gersola Lucci, our senior executive <laughs> dean, uh, who was at the forefront of developing prosthetic hands for amputees. She is currently a PhD student at UOW. So Siobhan, what motivated you to pursue a career in engineering? I'm a bit the same. Um, I didn't really know a whole heap about engineering going into it, um, but I just knew I really loved maths. I wasn't ready to let go of maths at the end of high school. Um, and I was sort of looking at options of like how can I use maths and engineering just sort of stuck out as something that was uh, an application of maths, so something that I could see and um, make a difference with and um, yeah, didn't know much about it but I thought hey I'd give it a go mm -hmm. and um, combine it with the sort of science side that I was also interested in but fell in love with the engineering. Yeah. Fantastic. Actually, that mirrors a, somewhat of my own uh, trajectory through my university as well, yeah. uh, of the double in maths and, uh, and engineering, so it's lovely to hear that. So I'm going to ask a couple of questions. We do have some questions to get the uh, ball rolling, so to speak. Um, and then uh, towards the end, we're going to invite also questions from the audience if you'd like to hear any more from any specific uh, panellists. But I'll open up one question, the next question, to anyone who'd like to uh, give us an answer. And, and I think this is really the heart of what we're here to talk about today. My question is, what unique opportunities and advantages have you observed women bringing to the field of engineering? What is it amazing about women that they, that, that they can bring to the field that uh, perhaps isn't there necessarily without them? Um, I can go ahead and start if you <laughs> yes. like. Uh, yes. For me, I have a team, um, in, in fact, throughout my career, I've created teams that are very diverse. And what br women in particular bring is organisation, um, much more collaborative, wanting to come to a solution together rather than um, my idea is the best idea, so help me. Um, and the other thing that's really interesting is they, they often have better emotional intelligence. So, you know, at, when you're working as part of a team and really driving change, 
you need to understand how you interact with each other and, and really work with your strengths. So for me, there are three things. Was there any other answer to that question? What, do, what unique uh, opportunities do women bring to the field of engineering? Um, well, yeah, I definitely agree, agree with the collaborating and the emotional intelligence. And I think that really helps bring teams together and get the most out of the entire, the entire team. Um, I also, yeah, and, and I think like my role as, as an engineer, I found that same idea of being able to bring a team together really cohesively has, has made a difference. But also, I was just, I, I'm on a lot of sites at the moment, Western Sydney Airport is, is what I've been working on, and um, they've got, they've been doing some Connect STEM uh, activity as well, and I went to that, and you know, we're all talking about women, and there's quite a few, you know, multi, the, the men in there, like from the sites, sort of helping out, I'm like, oh, how, how do you feel about this, about this whole, you know, <laughs> focusing on the women, do you feel, you know, you know, thinking, do you feel undermined, like, you know, we're, you know, all folk. and he's like, oh, it has been um, because they've made a real effort of having women in, in site roles as well um, as site engineers. And he said it's made a huge difference because especially in a, on, a, on a construction site, it, and if you have you know, um, predominantly male, often it can be a bit of an alpha male battle for the, the top spot. But women just sort of, like, sort of cut the air. When, you, when you've got women in the meeting, there's just a little bit less yelling, a little <laughs> bit more courtesy, better behaviours. <laughs> and so that enables Sometimes. a little more listening to each mm. other, you know, because they get kind of, you know, like through awkwardness, maybe put into that position. Um, so I think, I mean, it doesn't have to be women. I just think it's that it brings home that diversity kind of, yeah, definitely um, makes a difference. I'm definitely getting a sense of more collegial, less adversarial, it seems to be <laughs> coming through. Did any of the other panellists? Want to answer that question? No, if not, that's fine. Um, so the next question I'd like to talk about is what, what are we going to do about this? So um, just some of the stats that uh, Madeline mentioned earlier. So as a society, we are facing a shortage of engineers. Recent estimates from Engineers Australia call for at least an extra 100,000 engineers Australia-wide to cover proposed projects out to 2030. It's not that long, really. Currently, only 11.2% of working engineers in Australia are women. So the question is, how can industry, government and universities do better to get more women into engineering? What measures do you think could make the most difference? I think industry's come a really long way in this space in terms of recognising some of the barriers for women. Simple things like you know, female amenities and actually having toilets. Well, it, 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 it sounds really <laughs> trivial, but it's actually a really, really important thing to consider. And I think a lot of those structural things are being recognised and companies are really pushing towards that cultural shift um, in, in supporting women in, in the space. Um, I think the biggest barrier I've seen is more actually getting um, women into engineering degrees and the, mm -hmm. the cultural acceptance of people going into STEM areas. I, you know, for me, it was always that question of, well, why do you want to do engineering? Don't you want to do medicine or, or law? Mm -hmm. um, Engineering, I don't think, is generally seen as a culturally accepted um, space for women to go into. And I think changing that culture within Australia is, I think, a massive part of that. Getting our careers advisors on board and going, it, it is actually a valid career for women to go into, I think, is a massive part of that shift. I think that, that was mentioned earlier today about engineers not selling ourselves mm. well enough to mm. society at large, but also mm. to the next generation. Mm. And yeah. also uh, showing the diversity that mm -hmm. is in the engineering sector. I mean, you know, for my, my career, I've done everything from um, geohazards for where you're going to put pipelines, platforms, jetty structures, right through to, um, you know, now foundations and actually um, you know, in ensuring that our wind industry can, can get up and, you know, everything from the logistics from a port to where it needs to go. So there's a huge range of opportunities for engineering and I think we just need to showcase that because mm -hmm. I don't think we are. And really early on, like, mm -hmm. first year high school or in primary school is where we need to start to mm -hmm. make this change happening. Yeah, I think we need to make it really clear 
I think when people see, think of engineering, they think, well, do I want to take a bike apart and put it back together? Not really. <laughs> so that means I don't want to be an engineer. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. not. Like, it's, it's about problem solving. Like, if you like working in a team, like working with people and like solving problems and creating solutions, then engineering, you know, you'll love engineering. Mm -hmm. um, and it, you know, because, yeah, and it's not that, there's not the full appreciation of, you know, what engineering really is, like the, yeah. Yeah, that's so true. I mean, people still think engineers are train drivers. <laughs> you know, that's, uh, so yeah. So we, we have done ourselves a disservice. We, we are like very practical people, you know. We're quite modest often, you know. We, we like doing our maths and our engineering and all that, and we haven't really, um, like we said, showcased ourselves and what we do. But I think this issue of shortage of engineers is not new. Um, when I came to Australia, my husband and I, as you know, are both engineers. We came here because Australia did have a skills shortage of engineers. That's the only reason we got permanent residency to Australia. But when we came here, no one would give us a job. Mm. We both civil engineers, had experience. Our degrees were recognized, but we didn't have what's called Australian local experience. So no one would give us a job. And we persisted. Um, to stay in our professions, but many people who came at the same time, or even who come now as engineers who migrate here, um, you know, don't get, you know, don't get that opportunity. Their PhD is driving taxis, yeah. um, and I think that is a huge loss. So while we want to encourage, obviously, more people here doing engineering, I think there need to be programs to make sure that people who are invited to come to our shores on the premise that we need engineering are actually then supported to get into the industry as well. I think that's really, really crucial. But what you said about amenities is so true. Like it's not just industry, it is universities as well. When I was studying in, like I said, 1992 at UNSW, I think there only two floors in the sixth floor building had women's toilets. The first one was on the third floor. And 20 years later, when my daughter started studying there, that was still the case. You know, and that wasn't very long ago. She just finished five years ago, right? So there, there is a real issue with that. Um, and, and from what I know, and maybe someone could correct me, but there's more women going in to study engineering than there are in the field. So there's, there's many kind of things that we need to tackle. At, you know, universities, obviously, encouraging people to understand what engineering is, and then having um, you know, flexible kind of work arrangements. You know, I had two kids when I started my career in engineering, and it was, I must say, it was really difficult because I worked part time. I was expected to work full time. And if I couldn't do you know, full time work in my part time days, then I was like pushed down um, the career ladder. So, I mean, it is that you know, whole idea of women's work and men's work, which still kind of persists, sadly. Yeah, I mean, on that, I've noticed um, a big difference in my workplace, mm -hmm. even that whole idea of, um, yeah, keep just you might get women in, but keeping them, mm. keeping them in and going mm. to see level. And part of it is, um, you know, I suppose, yeah, the, the, the challenges that are presented in juggling sometimes that project, well, I'm in construction, so that demanding kind of, um, that, that construction wheel never stops. Mm. And, you know, if you don't keep up with it, you kind of get churned up <laughs> with Absolutely. it. So doing part, and so I've also gone through and done part time and had three children as well as keeping on to the, you know, doing this job. Um, but so I, a little bit of that is also feeling, uh, you feel a little bit less of the team mm -hmm. when you do the part time. Mm. But the, the, the recent changes, they've really changed their, um, maternity, uh, like paternity yeah, leave, yeah. Um, and there's a lot more men yes, exactly. doing like four days a mm -hmm. week mm -hmm. and sharing the primary care roles, mm -hmm. and it just changes the culture completely mm -hmm. because suddenly it's a level playing field. Yeah. And it's not just the women you have to work around with resourcing for part-time hours, mm -hmm. it's everybody. So yeah, it's been a real shift and a real positive shift. That, yeah. that is really important, I think, as, as employers, we need to make sure there's the flexibility for both men and women. Mm. Um, in our team, we have uh, our, our guys doing their kids drop up and pick, pick up. We, we have that flexibility and we just have, um, you know, we don't have meetings early, early in the morning up until 8.30 because a number of them have to do um, pick up and drop off. And something else that's really been impactful for me is I've got a number of engineers in my team, female engineers, 
and um, their new mums. And so for the first time when we had an off-site for the whole organisation, that was the first time that they, they lived their little ones. Mm. And, and it really impacted me and said, well, do we actually have to do all the travel that we do or, or, or can we be more flexible in mm. how we approach it? So that's what we're doing and it's, and it's, mm. it's really um, being impactful. I did want to go back to what you were saying mm. about um, when we were getting migrants into mm. Australia mm. for skilled mm. visas. I found the same as mm. well. So I had the I was fortunate enough to be able to employ in a number of engineers throughout Australia in the port sector. And we had really strong candidates mm -hmm. with great port experience, but they had been six, 12 months without being able mm -hmm. to get a job. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying, but you're so talented. So mm -hmm. I gave them, you know, mm -hmm. I've probably mm -hmm. given four mm -hmm. over in, in the last 10 years. And they were the, the best workers, biggest advocates. And a lot of them are just mm -hmm. coming up to their 10 year mm -hmm. an, uh, anniversary of working mm -hmm. for the organisation, creating a huge amount of value in our, in our regional regional ports. So mm -hmm. I think we need to stop the bias. It's not unconscious bias, mm -hmm. it's absolutely the bias, whether mm -hmm. it's uh, what nationality you are, whether you're female, um, mm -hmm. and, and we've got to call it out. Mm -hmm. We see it, we can't just ignore it. it. Now is the time that we've got to call it out. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. great. That's a fantastic segue to my next question, actually, in <laughs> terms of not so much bias, but certainly looking at um, ensuring that we're inclusive of uh, minorities, inclusive of, um, you know, as you say, uh, w whether it be female, whether it be um, Indigenous, whether it be uh, migrant uh, engineers. I guess for the people in the audience who don't fall into any of those categories, so I'm thinking maybe our male colleagues who um, are not in any of those categories, um, but would like to be an ally and would like to be a mentor, um, what should they, is there anything that they need to know about being supportive of women in the workplace? How can they help the cause? Being sponsors. Yeah, champions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And how do they do that? Um, well, yeah, people do it actively, you know, through, through active programs, which, um, uh, which is great, but it's also, I suppose it's done a lot informally. Um, so how is that, that that's promoting, mm -hmm. um, uh, sort of promoting you and, and putting you forward for, for opportunities mm -hmm. um, actively. Um, and, and I think that's often like a big problem. Well, you know, one of the things I think female engineers I, I see have challenge, challenges more with um, is promoting, self-promotion. Yeah. I, I mean, I struggle with it. <laughs> LinkedIn, I'm, I'm hopeless. <laughs> You've got to get better. I know, I know. LinkedIn. <laughs> it's one of my to-dos to this year, trust me. Um, but yeah, that, that idea of saying, well, you know, putting, you know, uh, broadcasting what you've done um, or what you can do, because I don't know, you, you kind of got more the mentality of, oh, I'm just going to get in there and solve the problem. I'm not, <laughs> you know, it's not. Um, and maybe it comes back to that collaborative thing that is like, well, I did that as a team not taking ownership for what you brought to the team all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so, yes, being able to recognise and, and help um, and help that promotion and, and opportunity, access to opportunities. Mm -hmm. To your point, like, I've had some absolutely fabulous advocates for me, like male advocates, um, who've helped push me forward um, throughout my career and I'm incredibly grateful for that. Um, I think that... Um, using those advocates to actually help create space. And by space, I mean physical presence and supporting ideas and giving mm -hmm. you that meeting weight, um, like advocating for your ideas within meetings and support in, in those sort of group forums is really, really important as well because it helps create credibility um, as well and develop your own capability um, to present your arguments and ideas with that backing of mm -hmm. others in the room. I think that's also a really important role to help in that space too. Definitely. I have a bit of a different view to that. <laughs> um, I think we are brilliant women engineers. Look, look at the engineers here. Um, I think we have the capacity. Uh, we have the intellect to do it. I think men should just step aside. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, give the space to us to be really frank. Yeah. I, 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 I do, 
I do agree with you in a lot of ways as well because um, what I I am quite good at self promotion. I've had to become um, because I wanted to change the dial. Um, and you know, I was the fourth female uh, CEO in the port sector in history, um, and I was the only one that went through a um, a competitive process to get that role. The other three had transitioned uh, into that role from working in the entity. And I have in the past been um, told that I'm, I'm too bold and I'm selfish and I'm, and I'm just about self-promotion. Mm -hmm. And that's not me at all as a person. So I think it's got to, we've got to change the mindset of that females being open and bold isn't because they're um, reflecting on their self, it's because they want to change a, 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 the agenda that's actually on the table. Um, also family, like my 17 year old and my soon to become husband are my biggest advocate and support and I'd do anything for them but they would do anything for me and, and for me that is really powerful as well. So, and my mum and dad and my grandparents. So it's that family unit and friends um, support each other, hold each other up, um, promote what, what um, the amazing women uh, in your life are doing and that's mm -hmm. going to change the agenda as well. Mm, fantastic. And I'd just like to go back to one of the things that we heard earlier around engineers sort of related, that engineers are not very good at selling ourselves to society and to um, younger, the younger generation who may be considering uh, a career. Uh, what we do find is that the engineering majors that perhaps have more of the make a difference advertising, uh, I'm talking the biomedical engineering field, the environmental engineering field, do tend to have slightly higher percentages of females than perhaps the more traditional uh, electrical, mechanical uh, and civil. Um, so I guess my question to the panel, and I'm going to ask this one to Siobhan because we haven't heard from you um, yet. Uh, so what does making a difference mean to you? Um, so I'm definitely part of that group of I like to sort of see a difference and um, I'm sort of heading towards biomedical engineering. Uh, my undergrad was in mechanical engineering but I did exercise science as my science degree um, and that was before the biomedical uh, degree was started so we're very glad that it started now. Um, so yeah I like to see a difference and I think I like to see a, like a, a difference on a personal level. Um, so I like to see someone's quality of life increase. Um, that's a, a really important thing for me in my sort of career moving forward. Um, also in terms of like making a difference, I have done a lot of tutoring in the engineering faculty and I think that's a really important part of sort of my journey as well is making a difference to the younger people coming through and making sure that young women in engineering can see that there are female teachers and female professors and Madeline was one of the first um, professors that I saw in engineering and it was one of those moments of, oh my gosh, there's a woman as a professor, she's standing out the front in engineering and I was like, oh, maybe I can sort of lean towards that or um, push myself to become that. So mm -hmm. it's sort of, you have to sort of see it to be it, I guess. Yep. Um, so yeah, that giving back is a, an also a, a big part of me making a difference. Mm. Fantastic. Um, any other answers from the panellists? What does making a difference mean to you? Well, I've done the full circle. My passion for climate change, um, I've gone through my career and actually I've got the skills now to uh, be able to help lead the way in the renewable energy sector. So I'm really proud to be Executive General Manager for Operations for Squadron Energy. Uh, who certainly are leading the way in uh, re the renewable firm, renewable industry. So that's mm -hmm. what I want to do. I want to help transition uh, the biggest uh, carbon emitting industry, being the electricity industry, uh, towards renewables. I think to that Fantastic. point, like we've got some amazing skill sets that we learn within engineering and the, the problems that are upcoming with not only just the reductions in electricity generation, but also you know, steel making and other core technologies. Um, the challenges to decarbonise are massive and the skill sets that engineers bring to those challenges are absolutely required and it's going to be a really, really interesting space over the next 10, 15, 20 years as we progress towards that goal. There's massive problems to solve 
um, and engineers are going to be so well placed to help solve them, whether that's within, you know, process engineering, looking at process challenges or electrical engineering and actually building and doing and implementing some of those changes, there's going to be a massive opportunity over the next few years in that space. Fantastic. Well, I might um, open it up to see if we've got any questions from the audience. You've heard some pretty uh, amazing stories. Um, are there any burning questions that can either be directed to an individual or to our five panellists here today? Yes. Uh, <coughs> Go ahead and I'll just repeat it for the people at home. Oh, yeah, I, I think I can yeah. um, remember. <laughs> yes. um, just one of the, uh, the things, like, you know, one of the challenges, I'm an engineer myself, I worked in Australia in a small family-owned businesses for several years before joining the university. A lot of challenges that I face personally, like you've mentioned the things like, you know, the, you know, toilet blocks for payments and things like that, but there are things that, you know, the big companies like Aero or BHP obviously can't get away with it, but 80% of our manu uh, Australian economy manufacturers are built are SMEs, so That's the companies right. who are employing more, less than 20 people. And these are the ones that, you know, are, are going to attract a large amount of workforce and engineers. So for years and years I've experienced, like, you know, um, being the only engineer in the workshop and also wherever I go, there wasn't a door that I would open, a cupboard door or a bathroom door that I wouldn't have been facing a naked picture of women, for example. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I've just told myself again, you know, on the back of what Maureen said as well, I grew up in a culture where it says, you know, well, you know, there are some limitations, but, you know, you've got to agree, or if you want to, you know, push the barrier, you're just going to learn to get along with it. So, again, like growing up, and I'm working in that environment, I kept saying, my God, that these things doesn't bother me. Like, you know, we just move on and we'll do the job and we're tough. But as a mother, of, as a proud mother of two girls, I don't want to be the situation where I have to tell my girls that you have to be, you know, if you want to work in engineering, mm -hmm. just ignore the naked picture. What do you think we can do, you know, as Marine, as, as, as a society, as, as, as a country, which for the very, you know, long future, these are small companies that are still going to be the large proportion of the manufacturing and industry that are attracting the stu uh, you know, students and engineers and females. What can we do to remove these problems? Yeah, I so mean, yeah, I, I think we've got to just be bold and challenge those, really. I mean, like I said, I came here as a migrant and for, for a long time I stayed quiet on those issues, you know, and, and more. So, you know, I had a master's and a PhD in civil and environmental engineering and I think about four years of structural engineering experience. Yet, the first job that I got um, in Australia was a junior, like starting mm -hmm. position. And, and the boss of that company, and it was a big company, I won't name it here, wanted to interview me to see if I was a cultural fit. So I, I wish now, looking back, I, I, sh I would have challenged them. You know, at many points in my time when you experience sexism or racism, I wish that I would have challenged them, but I learned within a few years that nothing would change for me, but also for the next generations. And that's, I get one of the big goals for me is to, for the next generation, to be able to not, to, to not face the same closed doors and challenges that I face. I really want to break down those doors. So I think we've just got to be really bold and, and challenge those things. Like no one is going to roll out a red carpet for us, to be really frank. Um, you know, we, we heard earlier how, how things change when you give examples of the paternity leave. It's only when men get that leave that the norms change, right? We see that they are also now. So I, like, I'm over it, frankly. We need to change things because it's good for us as well, not just necessarily good, good for men or good for society. We have faced disadvantage for too long, right? And we, we've just got to push hard. One of the best pieces of advice that I got when I was at university was feel the fear and do it anyway. And that's become kind of my threshold. It is when you feel the fear of doing something that you know it's exactly the right thing to do. <laughs> so yeah. Absolutely agree. Mm -hmm. We have to call it out. Mm -hmm. We have to, and it, it's everybody in this room that's got to call it out. Mm -hmm. And any room. It's not just the person. In fact, the person that is impacted by it shouldn't be the one calling it out. It should be everybody else that's, that's witnessing it. 
I was one of the first females working offshore on the west, in, on the west coast of Australia. On drill ships, so I used to go in and do geotech investigations before um, desired platforms and pipelines. And I experienced a huge amount of uh, discrimination and, you know, does your mother know you're here? Um, and really belittling me all the time. Um, in fact, one, uh, I think it was about the third time that I did any uh, nearshore uh, work, actually, um, one of the drillers uh, decided that it was really fun to take the photos that I was using to photograph the cores um, as they came up from the seafloor of their penises with um, downhole penetrator in, in the background. And that, in those days, it wasn't a, a um, you know, digital camera or anything like that. So it wasn't until I went back and actually had the human process that I found it. I went to my boss and said, I want you to do something about that. And his, his reply was, I'll get rid of the photos, you get rid of the negatives. Mm -hmm. And I said, no. <laughs> So I went above him to the CEO at the time, or managing director at the time, and I said, this is what I've just been told, now I want to escalate it. Mm -hmm. This cannot happen and I don't want it to be happening to anybody else. We want to get women in the offshore industry and it's never going to happy, happen if we don't make a stance now. And I worked with two of the biggest um, oil and gas companies, the CEOs, one happened to be a female and the other was male, and we actually changed the environment offshore to be more welcoming, more welcoming to women. And today it's actually a really nice environment to be working on the offshore ring, rigs or at Baranus Island or Barrow. And that, it took that change. But, but if we don't call it out, it's never going to change. And I bet it's nicer for the men too. Yes. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, Everyone's a benefit here. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> the environment when you have diversity is just so wonderful and powerful. Yeah, yeah because yeah, people who don't like us are staying quiet, you mm. know, like, you know, male, male and female apart, yeah. And, and what you said earlier, it shouldn't actually be the person who is the um, object of the discrimination. It should actually be everybody else because, as you know, we've heard before, the standard you walk past is the standard you accept. Absolutely. Yeah. Was there any other question from the audience? Yes, just in the centre there. Hi, thank you to all the speakers for presenting and um, inspiring so far. Um, my question is about the statistic I saw recently, some 60 to 80% of youth in the UK and the US, and I'm assuming Australia is somewhere in the middle, um, they choose social media influencers as their career. That's what they want to do. So it's not just engineering, it's sort of we're all in trouble. <laughs> That's a very good question. <laughs> I'm a LinkedIn advocate. Uh, um, how do we combat the tide of um, exciting new professions or exciting new uh, job uh, titles? Um, how does engineering compete? Yeah, there's nothing stopping you from being an engineer and a social media influencer. <laughs> Can I say that? <laughs> Yeah, there is, there is actually a, a TikToker, her name's Anna, she's a, um, an engineer and um, her sort of like start of her influencing career, I guess she was promoting engineering which was awesome and it was the first time that I'd, I'd seen like a female engineer on any social media and I was like, oh gosh, that, like hopefully she's inspiring some young women so it'd be good if we had some, some women who were already engineers and then wanted to be influencers, sure, and then combining those and becoming role models, I guess. Perhaps that's an opportunity for us, like everyone in this yeah. room, is to leverage that and, and share the message. I, like we said earlier, we're not necessarily great advocates for the engineering discipline, so maybe that's a, a takeaway from us, yeah. that we, we could um, spread that message a bit better. Don't look at uh, social media as, a, a, I guess, a, a, a negative or a hindrance, yeah. but look at it as an opportunity for how we can reach even more younger people. Yeah. So look, I'd like to finish up with one final question that I'll just pose to, um, I'd like to hear from each one of our panellists. Um, what advice would you give to young women, maybe young women um, watching this feed from home uh, at the moment, considering a career in engineering, especially those who are unsure or maybe hesitant? What advice would you give them? I think the biggest thing for me is that I thought engineering was like, oh yeah, I'm gonna go and fix cars or whatever. 
it's, it's so much broader and I didn't understand that going into engineering. So I think it's really important that we say, like engineering can take you anywhere. It can take you into the medical field, it can take you into the environmental field and mining, mechanical, any, anywhere you want to be, robotics. And I think it's important to show the diversity of the, the end product or the end career. Mm -hmm. And it's not necessarily, you might come into engineering thinking, okay, I'm going to be a mechanical engineer and you might end up somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And that's the beauty of it is it doesn't have to be what you thought it was initially, mm -hmm. but there's, there's room for everyone mm -hmm. um, in the different, the different range of careers that you can go into. Yeah, that's fantastic. A any other pieces of advice? Yeah, definitely go, go and do it if you're interested in STEM technologies. Generally, um, it's a great space to be in and it, um, it, it creates so many opportunities for you. I know within my career, I've had so, I've had so many different roles and worked in different areas, um, had the opportunity to travel, build cool things, go see the inside of massive, you know, I've seen inside the blast furnace, which was pretty cool. So though, those sorts of opportunities just don't necessarily arise in other disciplines. So it's, it's a really interesting space to be in. Yeah, actually, um, so, you know, I'm three years out of uni. I've gone to London on LTA and I'm in the room with, you know, working on a Jean Nouvelle building with architects and telling the head architect, nah, sorry, you can't. You can't put it there. <laughs> How about this option? <laughs> I'm like, this is cool. Like if, I had got, if I hadn't done architecture, it would have taken me 20 years to get here <laughs> to this, to, to be influencing decisions. <laughs> so it is, um, there's just, it's a really exciting, it's a really exciting space to, to be an engineer. And impactful. And, in, and very impact. impactful. Yeah. You, you know, so, yes, yeah, so tangible to your, um, like, and I've been a lot in the public building spaces. So um, I've worked on multiple art galleries and libraries. And I've taken my own children to, you know, Green Square Library I worked on and went, and it was just so exciting. It's like, this is mummy, it was all my building. Uh, <laughs> mummy's building. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just finished uh, Sydney Modern Art Gallery. I was the lead, uh, lead engineer in that. And going, I mean, the emotional, like just the fact going there on the opening day, the emotion you feel, like just, of, you know, it's like you're another baby, you know. Um, so the fruits it's, of your labor. The fruits of your yes, labor. Yes. yes, there's my blood, there's, there's, <laughs> there's a <laughs> month of my life. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, it's, um, it's really hard work, but the joy it brings um, is, is, is amazing with what. Um, I agree with what, everything that's been said. Um, the other thing that I'd say, be open to moving, relocating. Some of the most amazing experiences that I've had have been in really regional parts of mm -hmm. Australia. And I've been given opportunities that I wouldn't get if I stayed in a big city. Um, so really encourage you to spread your wings and, and go and look at some of the most beautiful parts of the world that we have right here in our backyard. I'll give you the same advice my dad gave me. Engineers can do everything and anything. <laughs> so in my life's journey, it's given me, you know, finite element analysis, big building, big structures, you know, recycling water, um, to decriminalizing abortion in New South Wales, banning greyhound racing. So just do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and can you all join me in thanking our panelists for <laughs> From my side as well, thank you to all the panelists and thank you for Monsi, um, to Monsi for doing such a, such a great job. Um, then um, we'll, we'll, let, we'll let the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Engineering and Information Sciences, um, Senior Professor Gursal Alici, have the last word today. He's a, a wonderful ally and um, someone who's, well, he's one of the, those guys who get it. So um, over to you. Thank you, Madam. I don't know where to start. I'm very, very happy. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> so I'm very, very happy, and uh, I don't know where to start. And I'm very excited, and I have full pride in what we have done today. And maybe I'll just make one point before I say anything else. 
And as Senator said, just give it to women, they will do a wonderful job. So that's what I did when we planned this event. Uh, Madeline, who is in charge of the equity, diversity, and inclusion in our faculty, we launched our um, uh, strategic plan and our initiatives last year in October under her leadership. That was wonderful. As part of this plan was to have these events to be organized. And we had a meeting a couple of months ago. We just talked about the general principles, what will be the format. Then I just left the rest to Madeline, to Jancy, to Monsi, and the other wonderful members of the faculty. And two weeks ago, they just told me that how the structure will be and how, what is my role. I said, I take it by all means. Thank you very much. So I'm very lucky it worked very well, and, and, and I'm very lucky that women make a significant difference in our life, in our journey. If I reflect on my education and growth, everything I have, I owe to my mom, who can't speak and write any language. But she engineered me, if I can. Put that way as well, engineers not only solve problems, they also help grow nations and people as well. So I don't know what I can say today, just on behalf of my faculty, I really want, want to express my sincere gratitude to all of you for joining us on this momentous day for women in engineering. Also today, we have witnessed the power of equity, diversity, inclusion, and the incredible contributions of women in engineering. Maybe I'll start with our keynote speaker, Senator Marin Faruqi. Your talk, and of course, before your talk, Aunt, Auntie Joyce once, Vice Chancellor's talks, and on top of that one, your story, what you told us, shows the limitless potential each of us has it, what we can achieve irrespective of your gender, your background as well, what women can do in any area. That's very inspiring and it's a wonderful story to share and to follow. Thank you very much, Senator, for coming. <clears throat> And also, I would like to express my appreciation to our panelists and the moderator, Monsi. And thank you for coming, your points of view, your way of describing the opportunities, the obstacles, and the way forward is, is inspiring beyond imagination. Thank you very much. <laughs> One thing I always try to promote my students, yes, Siobhan is my student since she came from high school. One thing, it wasn't in her CV, maybe wasn't mentioned, she won at the same time is studying medicine. So she's going to be the first doctor, doctor of this university. <laughs> that was a bit some unfair to what she won. And this afternoon we are meeting at 2.30 to discuss her PhD progress on top of what she is doing in a hospital. <laughs> so thank you everyone very much. Of course today we have also uh, this has been a celebration of talent, determination, diversity, and inclusion, as we heard from everybody. And also, we are very honored to have our university president, Professor Davidson, and thank you for your support, your encouragement. When I was appointed, maybe about 20 months ago, we talked about this, and you were always very supportive when we came to you with the plan and your support, your encouragement made a huge difference. Thank you very much for always supporting my faculty, my staff, and showing the way forward to make a difference. Maybe we'll con conclude it now. We got a high spirit and let's work together to create a future where diversity is celebrated. Of course, di diversity is not only about gender, it's about other things. I came to this, you know, this country 22 years ago, for one year only. Looks like I made a big calculation mistake. <laughs> so it has been 22 years. So 
We need to celebrate what each of us brings to this country, not only gender, the other things as well. I mean, one day, when I write my memoir, I got many things to share. So it's not only about gender, inclusion, diversity, equity, and belonging are some features we all have to work and celebrate that these are the spices of the life, spices of being human beings. You don't need to have an associate dean or a unit to implement them. These are something which make us human. Still, there is a long way to go. I witnessed all of them. I still witness them. So there's a long way to go. This is the beginning of to celebrate diversity, inclusion, and, and belonging. I think I thanked everybody. I really want to thank. This is a, a big event for us and all the volunteers. If I start reading the names, I think we need another 10 minutes. So I'm not going to do that one. As I said, the faculty team, the university team, the volunteers, RAN team, volunteers, and Kanyo, everybody contributed to the success of this event. So let's work together to remove those barriers our speakers, our panelists talked about. Let's work together how we can increase the number of female students who, can, who will study STEM subjects in high school early in year six, year seven, not at year 11, year 12. How we can increase the number of female students studying STEM and practicing STEM. As Madeline said, Engineers Australia has some data around 50% of female engineers practice. So the rest do something else. So we need to do lots of many things like sponsorship, scholarships, mentoring, work integrated learning. There is a 50 page report in, prepared by Engineers Australia how we can show by example, as Siobhan said, as Madeline said. We have to show by example and we have to work together to show that there is a wonderful career. And women are pillars of our life. This is my sincere view, this is my frank view. I know from my family, I know from my wife and, and, and daughter as well. So women's, I mean, they make a huge difference. So maybe I'll finish it here and then thank you again. And before we, I, I conclude, we conclude, and I think we are over time, we are very excited. I would like to invite the panelists, including the Senator Faruqi, just to give a small token of appreciation for being here and to celebrate this momentous event all together. Happy Women in Engineering Day, everybody. Thank you for coming. <laughs>